Hi, everybody. My name is Yasmin Sherry. Today, I'd like to talk about the manufacturing technologies of today and, um, <laughs> and the factories of tomorrow. OK, so here we go. So if you think about the way we manufacture things today, we use very harsh um, ways of making them. So we have high temperature, high pressure, creating irreversible chemistry. Not only are we damaging our ecosystem, but we're removing ourselves from it. We've done a great job to separate ourselves from the living world. Now, we can start looking at biology as a revived tool to um, connect ourselves back with nature and kind of change the way of making things. And if you look at living systems, they take um, all the nutrients in this living system are part of a cycle. And we can kind of look at this as a way of doing, doing design today. And we have to really seriously look at these concepts and um, bring it back to the way we think, the way we do things. This is a factory today. It's not very different from this is a factory today. It's not very different from a living factory, which is kind of like a cell. What a resource enters and a product exits. Housed within these factories are machines that read instructions. Resource enters, instructions follow, and out comes a product. This is not, once again, different from the cell. They both have this exit, enter, exit system. For this one, amino acid enters as a machine, the ribosome uses it to create mRNA, and then that creates a protein. But if you think about the, the language that these machines use, they're not very different either. Here we have binary code, and here we have the DNA. And if you think about it, um, the manufacturing technologies of today really rely on the binary code, because we're using computers to design the the products that we have today. So we can kind of see the same similar kind of pattern. But we've been designing living things, well, we've been using them for a long time. We've been harnessing the power of microorganisms to create living things, to, to create living products for us for a long time. We've been fermenting our food for 8,000 years and our beers and our drinks. And especially in the past few years, we've been able to manipulate these um, microorganisms to create something new. But this is nothing new. We've been using this for a long time. We're used to seeing insulin created by microorganisms. Biopolymers and biofuels are on our way. But what is new is that we're creating synthetic life. And when we can think about this, we can start imagining what kind of living factories we might be able to create at a higher level. So the way these microorganisms work and the, and the way we use them is that we take the code, we manipulate it to create a product. What we're moving towards is a kind of abstraction system. But once again, this is nothing new. We've been doing this with um, computer science. So we've taken the binary code, we've abstracted it into an interface where we can actually humanize it and understand it. So this is kind of an interface. As an industrial designer, I do this all the time. We but I'm using it at a higher level. I don't need to understand the binary code in order for me to create this design and send it to the manufacturer. And what happens is that I'm working at a higher level, creating this design with these interface, while the machine is reading this lower level and sends that to the factory that creates, I don't know, sends it to the injection molding or um, CNC. So we're doing kind of similar thing in biology, or well, at least we're trying to. And although we're not at the abstraction level and we're trying to create that, we, we've created standardized biological parts. With these parts, we can start making devices. And we can actually order these things in a kind of plug and play system, put them together to create systems. An example of this is the International Genetically Engineering Machine Competition, which is called iGEM. Thousands of students every year gather in different universities to create novel designs through these biological parts that are standardized. So we can st create a systematic way of designing biology. And what they do is that they take these things and create systems that can create products. So an example of this is the bio, um, bio um, polymers, or sorry, not biopolymers, <laughs> bioconcrete. And another example, which is the second one that you can see with the colors, is that you can actually redesign um, these sensors, biosensors, that can detect through their environmental um, feed 
what is around them and they can change their pigment. So this pigment becomes interesting to people like designers. And so people who are part of these projects are not just scientists and science students. They're actually designers and, and I don't know, poets and people like that getting together to create um, the future of our design. So you can take these pigments and actually create like a living product. So I can tell you maybe if you have a disease. So maybe if you have can can uh, a kind of cancer, it will turn blue. Designers are using this. And another example is using bioluminescence. So as we begin to abstract these, um, these biological codes, we, get, we begin to design at a higher level as well. This is already something that exists in nature. At a lower level, it um, synthesizes, it um, regenerates and recreates and metabolizes. And at a high level, it has smell, it has color, it has taste, it creates its own packaging. It has sensors that tell it when to fall off the tree to finish its manufacturing. So we can kind of see where we can go with these living factories and how design becomes a bio kind of a bottom-up approach to biology. Now this is an example called growth assembly. Designers are jumping on this because now we can design, when we go to this abstract level, we can design morphology and behavior. So it's not just at the, at the code level. Ginsburg um, from RCA designed this um, conceptual design where you, you can engineer and design your seed that can grow the products of the future and you can actually pick your products and assemble them together and, and, and they won't be manufactured really. Another example is Philips Design, the company. Um, they've created this future of your um, kitchen where you have different parts of your kitchen which is um, run by microorganisms and essentially they become a system. So it, your food is grown by them, and your waste is um, processed by them, and the waste becomes the food of the other, so it kind of becomes this living microbial home. Now finally, I'd like to present to you my own project that I'm working on, and it's called Living Skin. And what this is, is a microbial polysaccharide called xylenum, which creates this incredible amount of cellulose that is tightly super fine um, cellulose networks that are at nanoscale. And the remarkable thing about this is that the cellulose level are actually way smaller than, um, than one of the plant. That's the plant, that's the microbial cellulose. And so this is what it looks like when you play around with it. I've grown it, which in common, ground, in common terms is called kombucha, and you might have had the drink. But what it creates is this gelatinous membrane. And this gelatinous membrane is kind of like a bio leather when you grow it and you, um, when you dry it. And the nice thing about it is that this kind of becomes like a biomaterial and you can harvest it. So this is me picking it off. And I start to play around with this and started to grow it at a larger scale. This is the size of a table. And if you can start to harvest these kinds of materials, and some people are using this as biomedical um, products and because what it can do is it can soak up 200% of its own biomass of water. These kinds of properties are incredible and why are we not looking into this further? So you can actually begin to harvest these kinds of materials and if you think about it, it kind of comes back to the point I was making about growing of things. Rather than taking the resources, process them to the point where the chemistry changes so that you can't bring it back, why don't we just grow things? Of course, you're all wondering, well, how? Why, why are you talking about this? So if this is the factory of today, and maybe the factory of tomorrow might be at a cell level, then we can start designing um, seeds, and then we can grow our products. So the manufacturing plant of the future will create new design discourses, and we have to really seriously think about the design language and think about what are the implications of this. And when we think about this, we have to reassess our design principles. Now, we might not necessarily think about aesthetics or cycle time. We have to think about ecosystem, biodiversity, evolution. And if this is our factory, then we have to start thinking about what kind of products we, these might create. And maybe our products will become smart, adapt, metabolize, self-assemble, self-generate and self-repair. 
And with this, I'd like to end with the fact that we're changing life as we know it. And I'm sure that you're all asking, how is this possible? But before asking whether this is possible or not, because let's admit it, we've, we've been questioning this for a long time and we're gonna get there. But the questions we should be asking aren't ones that, is this possible? We should be asking, who are the stakeholders that will grab this technology? Who will profit from it? Is it safe? And these are things that we have to talk about openly, not just as biologists and designers, but as, as every citizen. We have to be part of this dialogue. And with that, we have to hope that the products, that this technology will bring products that are adaptive, that are malleable and open. These products will be, hopefully, adapting with their designers. Thank you. <laughs>